asking right there. Questions from the homework. What would you like me to go over now is your chance to ask. First from page 440, whatever this is, 443, and then I'll do a couple from the other one as well. There was some nasties. I know. Oh, but some cool ones. Which ones? Oh, come on. You have to, yes, you did raise your hand. I was going to say you did the homework. Excellent. I'd love to do number eight. Okay. One of the cards is red and the other is black. How many cards? No, no. How many cards are we picking? Two. Tree. More than two, we'll learn other stuff. Three, I'll sometimes still do a tree, but we did say a tree gets pretty unwieldy when we have three or four or five. So, uh, and here's my tree. I figure black on the first one. You know what? Instead of doing not black, why don't I just do R for red? Red on the first one. Second card could be black again, red again, black again, red again. And you know what? I'll even put a one there for the first and a two there for the second. How many black cards in the deck? So this is going to be 26 out of 52, 26 out of 52. Oh, down this branch, you picked a black card. How many are left in the deck? 25 out of 51, 26 reds out of 51. Here you picked a red, so you got 26 blacks out of 51 and 25 reds out of 51. Double check, do they add to one, do they add to one, do they add to one? I built an error check. One card is red and the other is black. Here's what I think. I think it could be this branch or that branch. What does or mean? So it's going to be this times this plus this times this. Come in. Hello, hello, hello. Howdy. Come on in. I'm just going to hit pause here quickly. Continue. Sorry about the interruption for those of you following along at home. Um, you good? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, by the way, could you, now that you see this, could you have visualized the tree without drawing it? Sometimes for two events, if they're fairly simple events, I'll do that in my homework. When in doubt, though, the tree makes it so clear. Okay? And yeah, the shortcut is this times this times two, apparently. Any others from uh, page 445 and following? Okay, then I also assigned some questions from page 450-ish. And these ones are tougher, but in my mind also, i got to be honest, Jen, these ones are nerdily cooler in my mind. They're nerdically delicious or something like that. Any, I just made that up, is that good? Good, I'll use that for the remainder of my teaching career. Okay. Um, any of these you want me to go over? Because I know all of you did the what's the probability of a student waking up on time for class question, yes? Some of you did it three or four times and were dismayed. Yeah, okay. Um, any of these you want me to go over? Yes, sorry, I didn't see you there. 5C, I would love to do 5C. Okay. How many people are there in this question? Brett, three. Uh, boy. I'll do a tree. This is about the limit of how big a tree I'll do. This is going to be a fairly complicated tree. It's Andy can solve it or not. Barry can solve it or not. Barry can solve it or not. <sighs> Curtis can solve it or not. Curtis can solve it. Oop, don't put a or not. Curtis can solve it or not. Curtis can solve it or not. And I'm going to cheat. Because this is such a long tree to draw, I'm only going to fill in these branches. So I'm already going to put a check mark under only one. Here, all three solved it. You know what? Only one guy solved it on this branch right here. Only A solved it. What's another one that has only one? A, uh, here. Right? Didn't? Yes, didn't. And... Yes, yes, uh, sorry, no, no, yes, there. Okay, let's fill in just those branches as a time saver. And this is one way you can kind of be to cut corners a little bit. Uh, they're independent, so it's going to be 
one third, two thirds. It's going to be one half, one half. Oh, I'm filling in everything for some dumb reason after I told you I was only going to fill in part of the branches. I got carried away with the mathiness of it, sorry. And it's independent, so it's going to be three fifths, two fifths, three fifths, not three, Mr. Duke. Two fifths, and you can see how cluttered it's getting. And this is also why a three level tree is a bit much, but it works. Um, multiply down, add across. So this or that or that, it's going to be one third. Do I need to keep going, or you, can you take it the rest of the way yourself? Right? So I keep going? Okay, love to. Times one half times two fifths, that's uh, that branch. Or, what does or mean? I love it. Uh, two thirds. Uh, you know what, Mr. Duick? Cleverly highlight since you got this fancy technology. Two thirds, one half, two fifths. Or two thirds, one half, three fifths. Now you can pull out your graphing calculator if you need to. I think all of these is going to be over 6 times 5. All of these fractions are going to be over 30. That's my common denominator. And it's going to be 2 plus 4 plus 6, which I think I can do in my head. 2 plus 4 is 6. Oh, uh, 12 out of 30, which in lowest terms, divide by 6. Divide by 6 is, is it 2 out of 5? Is that what it says in the back? Yeah. Woohoo! There you go. Okay. That's about as much as I'll tackle with a tree. Three different events and three levels. Yeah, that's a lot of work. There is a way to do this coming down the pipe with combinatorics. Is untied. Any others? We're good. So we're going to move on to what to me is the coolest or one of the funnest lessons of the year and also one of the most counterintuitive so let me press pause while i'm handing stuff out i hit pause lesson five conditional probability and correct me if i'm wrong on your notes on the back page the right part of the page is blank yes so we're gonna do just to kind of jog our memory here a uh, generic kind of a tree so if you can go to where the blank section is down here, and as a little heading, you can write generic probability tree. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to fill in a tree completely with symbols so that if you even get a question with symbols on it, you can, oh, they're talking about this branch. Okay? I'm going to move this out of the camera's way and closer to me because I need my caffeine. So we're going to have two events, events A and B, generic events. So we would go like this. A, what am I going to write over here? What's our symbol for not? Not A. And then we're going to have event B, whatever it is, and not B. B and not B. And then what we introduced last day, Jen, was the idea of weighting the branches. We put numbers here. In terms of symbols, the number that we put here was the probability of A occurring. So in case they give it to you that way, you'll know that's that number. What would I call this as a symbol? The probability of, take a guess, not A. Okay. And then we introduced the notion of conditional probability, or given that. We call this the probability of B occurring given that you're down the A branch, uh, given that A has occurred. What do you think we call this? The probability of B not occurring, given that you're down the A branch. All right, let's see if we can use our math nerd brains. 
what am I going to call this one here? And I'm going to have to kind of write small. Wait a minute, Mr. Duick. There's an advantage to the software, Mr. Duick. Where's your lasso? Right there. Yeah. Move that over a little bit. Boom, boom. Ha! It's an ugly tree, but I want it to be big enough so you can read things. What do you think I'm going to call this one here? Probability of B, given that A did not occur. And David, since you're on a roll, what am I going to call this one? The probability of B didn't occur, and I already know that A didn't occur. Oh, and we said you know they're independent if these two branches match those two branches. That was the easy definition of independence, as opposed to thinking to yourself, does it affect, or the yucky math definition. What we're going to look at today, instead of saying, what's the probability of B given that A have occurred, filling in this one, what we're going to say is this. If we know this occurred, which could be this branch or this branch, what are the odds that I came down this one but not that one? We're going to go backwards up the tree. Okay, That's our goal. So here's our generic tree, and today is going backwards. That's about as ugly a tree as I could have drawn, but I'm going to leave it because I'm an imperfect teacher, and I'm not embarrassed by it. So a pot is red. Now, we're going to start out, first of all, getting just a little more complicated. Then we're going to move backwards up the tree. Here we have two separate little pots. We're going to pick a pot first, and then we're going to pick a bill. And it wants to know what's the probability that we get a $10 bill. But you know what? Let's fill in our tree. So the first, first event here is we have to pick a pot. We have to pick pot one or pot two. How many pots are there? What are the odds of picking pot one? Yeah, now sometimes what they'll do to make it more interesting is they'll have you roll a dice, and if you get a one or a two, you'll pick pot one, and a three, four, five, or a six, you'll pick pot two, in which case it's not one or two. But this one, I think, is straight 50-50. Then, what are the possibilities from each pot? I can get a $0 bill, and I know we talked but a $0 bill, a $10 bill, and a $20 bill. So I think I'm going to have 0, 10, or 20. 0, 10, or 20. Right? Let's fill in the weights. If we're in pot one, down this branch, what are the odds of getting a zero? One out of three, what are the odds of getting a 10? One out of three, what are the odds of getting a 20? One out of three, double check that to one. Yay, got it right. And that's why, Brett, I rarely don't do the whole tree. That built-in error check to me is so handy. That's why I started doing it instinctively when you asked me that question earlier. Oh, now we're in pot two. What are the odds of getting a zero? One out of four. What are the odds of getting a 10? Yeah. What are the odds of getting a 20? One out of four. Okay, we've got our tree. And you'll find you get pretty quick at drawing these. Now let's answer the questions. What's the probability of a $10 bill is chosen if it's known that pot one is the selected pot? Okay, here's what this is saying. If is another word for given that. It's actually saying probability of 10 given we're down 1. That's why I did that generic tree earlier. Can you see which number they're talking about? Which number is sitting in the 10 given 1 branch? 1 third. It's not multiplied down. They didn't say, what are the odds of getting pot one and a $10 bill? They said, look, you know you're in pot one. What are the odds of getting a 10? Two. What are the odds of a $10 bill if you know you're in pot two? In terms of our notation, it's a 10 given that two has occurred. Sorry? Two out of four. 
What's the probability that a ten dollar bill is chosen? Now they have think probability tree diagram. We already did ours here. What's the probability that a ten dollar bill is chosen? It really means this branch or this branch. And here is where we're going to go multiply down, add across. The probability that a ten dollar bill is chosen, what we're really saying is in our notation, it could be pot one and a ten dollar bill, or pot two and a ten dollar bill. And I'm not a big fan of the notation. I like the tree, but Madison, I want to make sure if they use it, you're kind of not terrified by it. Comma means and. What does and mean? Times. What does or mean? At. It's going to be this times. The, it's going to be one half times one third, or one half times two quarters. Is there a built-in common denominator here? Then you know what? I'm going to wimp out and go to my graphing calculator. And it's not that I don't want you to know how to do fractions. It is that I'm interested in saving time. So I'm going to go 1 half times 1 third plus 1 half times 2 quarters. And then how do you get that? Oh yeah, math, enter, enter. 5 out of 12. Piece of cake. Okay. Here is the question we're going to try and ask today. Suppose David has just played this game, but I didn't watch him, but he's holding a $10 bill. What's the probability it came from pot one? Can you see what they've done in this part D? They've told you the bottom outcome, and they're asking about the top outcome, going backwards. Okay? Says, begin by translating this as a conditional probability. Probability of, let's see, what do I know here? What's the, by the way, if that's the given, given that we have a $10 bill. What do they want us to find? One. So the first step to doing conditional probability, and this is the only time that I'm going to do this com completely with a formula, is translating it into probability speak. Yeah. Uh, sure. Although if you were really able to concentrate and you were a good student, you should be able to handle the district. Shut up, Mr. Dirk. Okay, fine. My bad. Okay. Um, do me a favor, This is because this is the only time I'm using the formula. Can all of you either find your formula sheets or flip to the inside cover of your workbook? Because it's there too. And what I'd like you to find is the formula that says this, the probability of B given A. It's on there, which, by the way, is really what we have here with different stuff. B given A is on there, is it not? Is A given B? Yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. My bad. I couldn't remember. Is it A given B? And what does it say? It's the probability of A and B. B divided by the probability of B. That's the formula that we're going to use, but I got to say that's fairly ugly because I always get confused by the letters. So I'd like you to write this down, and then I'm going to give you Mr. Duick's handy dandy truncated version of this. Okay, so there's the formula. I don't remember it that way. I remember it as when they give me a, I got to translate this statement. I look for words like if or given or suppose is another word that they use. And I say it's the probability of both over the probability of the given. I remember both over given. It's much easier for me to keep track of the letters because, Brendan, often the A is where the B is and the B is where the A is, and it gives you, yeah, forget it. I'm not going to wrap my brain around it. I know that for conditional probability, it's going to be the probability of both over the given one. So let's go to this question that we have here. 
the one that we're actually trying to answer. If David won 10 bucks, what are the odds that it came from pot one? Given that $10 has occurred, what's the probability that it came from pot one? That's going to be the probability of, another word for both is and, one and 10 divided by, The probability of what? 10. Now, why is that so helpful? Go look at your tree. Do we have a branch that has 1 and 10? Walk down that branch, because and means what? Multiply down. What numbers are going to go on top of the fraction here? Two fractions. What are they? 1 out of 2 and and you know it's the one-third because this says both. I know I'm going down the one column, not the two column. Over um, 10. Now, 10 would be that or that. What does or mean? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't we just figure that out right here? Conveniently, they snuck in. This is the probability of 10. Right? We did look at... Both possibilities multiply down, add across. In fact, the number that's going to go here is just 5 out of 12. Don't reach for your calculators yet. The top multiplying fractions is the easiest operation. Top times top, bottom times bottom. 1 out of 6 divided by 5 out of 12. Boys and girls, how do you divide by a fraction? We've done, oh, is that why you stuck, I stuck this in earlier in the year. I could, in a pinch, do this whole thing by hand. It's going to be 1 out of 6 times 12 out of 5. So, 12 over 30, or in lowest terms, which is what they would put, uh, divide by 2 out of 5? Strange enough, the same answer as Brett's question earlier today. That's a fluke. But conditional probability, going backwards, if they tell you the bottom has occurred and they want you to figure out the odds that one of the top things has occurred, <coughs> it's both over the given one. Example two. One of the places this is used is an in industry to track defects. As a matter of fact, there was a mathematician back in the 1950s who was doing a, his doctorate on probabilistic sampling methods. And so he went to the big three automakers, Ford, GM, and American Motors. He said, look, I can guarantee that if you let me go through your factory, I can teach you how to set up your factories using probabilistic sampling methods so that you'll catch more defects before they go to the lot in your cars. You'll catch more mistakes before they leave your plant. Ford, GM, and American Motors were not interested. No, thank you. So, okay. So he went across the sea to Japan. And he pitched the idea to Honda and Nissan, which was Datsun at that time, and Toyota. And they said, this is great. You mean we don't have to tell our workers to do any better? We don't have to change anything? We'll just catch more stuff mathematically? Yes. It won't cost us anything? Nope. And that's why in the 60s and in the 70s and in the 80s, Japanese cars had a reputation as being better made. It wasn't that they were coming off the assembly line better. They were catching more mistakes mathematically. They were able to, if they found a mistake, go backwards up the tree and find where it had come from. Something like this. Uh, the, the American motor companies didn't start applying a lot of this until the early 90s, and they're still trying to catch up. So here's one place that it certainly changed several countries' economies. A company has two factories that make computer chips. Cars, if you want to go to the 50s. 70% uh, of the chips come from factory one. 30% of the chips come from factory two. In factory one, 25% of the chips are defective. In factory two, 10% of the chips are defective. Suppose you don't know from which factory a chip came. What's the probability that a chip is defective? 
what they're really saying is find the probability of, how about the letter D for defective? I think this is the same as the previous question. There's two events. Pick a factory and then pick a chip. So I'm going to do a tree. How about F1 for factory 1? What would be clever to use for factory 2? F2, you say? What's the probability that something come, that a chip comes from factory 1? Read the question. 70%, which as a decimal is 0.7. What's the probability that it comes from factory 2 then? 0.3. Then from factory 1, we can be defective or not. Defective or not. What's the probability that a chip is defective given that it's from factory 1? 0.25. What about not defective? Use the complement, right? This this is where the complement also comes in really handy. Okay, given that you're in factory two, what are the odds that the chip was defective? 0.1 and 0.9. So this first question is simply saying, what are the odds that it's defective? Well, look, how many branches end in defective? I think it's going to be this one or this one. What does or mean? Multiply down, add across. In fact, now in my probability speak, this is really the probability that we're defective and factory one, given factory one, or the probability that we're defective, sorry, not, my bad, Mr. Do it, not given, and, because we're multiplying down, we're multiplying down, probability that you're defective and factory 2. Now there's the probability notation which I'm not a fan of. I can see from the tree it's going to be 0.7 times 0.25 or 0.3 times 0.1. And yes, you're allowed to use your calculator this time. I will tolerate going to a calculator for basic decimals. If you have a stack of chips, you don't know what's the odds that it's a defective one. You pick one at random. Jordan, what'd you get? Okay, sorry. Amrit, what'd you get? Since I see you racing for your calculator. Blinding speed. Oh, the blur. The blur. Ooh, my hair's getting blown back. I feel the wind. I feel the wind. What'd you get, folks? 0.205? Or if they wanted you to go to a percent, 20.5%. By the way, I'll take both answers, but if it's multiple choice, you better be able to, if they want a percent, be able to recognize the percent answer, right? The more interesting question to me is B. Oh, by the way, I like this question. I like this question. I like this question. I like this question. Why do you think I'd say that, Dylan? I think there's, why would I say that I like this question? Sorry, what? You didn't hear me say it was going to be on the test. You're just a good student who notices those things? Okay. Fair enough. Brainiac? That's absolutely, when I think of you, that's the first thing that pops into my, I almost got it straight. I almost got it out. Sorry, my friend. I came close, though. Appreciate it. Always. Read B to me, kiddo. Stop. That's also, an, especially for my ESL students, that's also another synonym or trigger word for given. The three words they use most often are suppose that, or if, or ideally given. That's my preferred trigger word. I usually will use that, but yeah, start over, kiddo. Keep going. Uh, suppose that a factory chip is, is discovered. What is the probability of the chip being we need to translate this into a probability statement. What's the given? What do we know? What's the suppose? No, what's the suppose? What's the given? 
the given is that it's defective. They've told me the bottom outcome. That's also how you can recognize that we have to use this. What do they want us to find? Okay. We're going backwards up this tree. And how are we going to do that? We can use the fancy schmancy complicated conditional probability formula from our formula sheet. Or Mr. Duick said it's really easier to remember this is going to be both over the given. And by both, I mean and. It's going to be defective and factory one divided by just plain old defective. Now the nice thing here is, what did we find in part A? The probability of what? We actually found the denominator already. They won't do that always, but often part A will be find this, and then part B will be a conditional, and hey, great, a defective, which is 0 0.205. Defective and F1. Oh, 0.7 times 0.25. Put your pencils down and look up for a second. Once you've written that down. Just for what it's worth. You, may, you know, I'm big on built-in error checks. This 0.205 came from 0.7 times 0.25 plus 0.3 times 0.1. It came from this. Right? First of all, can I cancel? Have I? So can't cancel. But if you are doing a conditional probability, one of the built-in error checks is the both will always appear somewhere in the bottom. If it doesn't, you messed up or missed something. Having said that, I know this is 0.205. I'll leave this here in the notes. You guys just wrote 0 0.205, so the answer is going to be 0 0.7 times 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, Mr. Duick, divided by 0 0.205. What are the odds that it came from factory one? 85.3, sorry, 85.4 percent, 0 0.854, 0 0.854. or 85.4%. Turn the page. A few more. And then, maybe I'll save your life. What, really? Yeah. Uh, example three. Uh, oh, we're picking two cards without replacement. Gotcha. They want the probability that the second card drawn is a king. You know what? It depends. What does it depend on? First card is a king. So let's set up our tree. We could have king on the first, not king on the first, king on the second, not king on the second, King on the second, not king on the second. Let's fill in the branches. How many kings are there in the deck? Out of? How many non-kings? Please don't count. Use the complement. 48 out of 52. All right, down this branch, we picked a king. We picked a... We picked a... We picked a king. Haha. -ha. How many kings are now left in the deck? Out of? How many non kings? 48 out of 51. Now, here, I didn't get a king. How many kings are left in the deck? Four out of 51. How many non kings? 47 out of 51. Okay, we got our tree. And trust me, the trees get pretty quick to draw. They want the probability of king 2. 
How many branches end in king two? Two of them. Multiply down, add across. Four out of 52. Three out of 51. King one and king two. Or first card could have not been a king. Good gosh, Mr. Duick, let's fix that. Make that a proper two. And second card could have been a king. Now, we noticed yesterday that 52 times 51 was 2652. I've got that one memorized because it shows up so often. The top is going to be 4 times 3, 12, plus 48 times 4, 196. 12 and 196 is... 196 and 12 is... 20, is it 208? Someone check my math. I'm doing it all in my head. Am I? No? 204? 208. Is it 208? 208? Thought I was wrong. Please, I never make mistakes. All right. I have a doubter here in the front row. 4 times 3 plus 48 times 4 is 204. I am wrong. Mr. Do it, David. Did you set me up for that? Because if you did, I say to you, well played. Yes. Yes, you may hustle back, kiddo. Where did I botch that? Because it's not 196, Mr. Do it. It's 192 plus 12. Now, that question, Nicole, we actually did yesterday, last day. What's the first word, Nicole, of part B? Conditional. Okay, so let's set up the statement. Given, what's the given that they gave me? You're right, say it louder. In my notation, what is it? K1, not K1, K2, not K2. Which? K2, right? What's the probability that what? What's the probability that the first card was? Not, so what am I going to write here? Not K1. Okay. I'm getting a bit lazy, Jordan. I'm actually just going to write that's both over the given. Okay. Which branch has both of those? That's what's going to go on top. Uh, this one has both. This one, yes? Yes, yes, yes. It's going to be 48 out of 52 and 4 out of 51. Yo. Yeah. Try, see if you can finish the rest of this on your own, my children. We're back. By the way, did you guys actually calculate K2, or did you just use this number from here? You could have just dropped this ugly fraction, but in case you hadn't done part A ahead of time, you could have just said, oh, get K2. Oh, that's, whoop, turn the pen on, Mr. Duick. That's K2, or that's K2. You could have, excuse me, I got the hiccup suddenly. You could have gone 4 out of 52 and 3 out of 51 or 48 out of 52 and 4 out of 51. However, since Jen, we already figured out what this works out to, I'm going to this time erase it and I'm just going to go to saying, hey, this is 204 divided by 2652. I like to, for these, because they're multi-level, multi-level fractions, I'm a little concerned about how my calculator will actually work. So usually what I do here is work out the whole top in lowest terms. I go 48 over 52 times 4 over 51. Enter, math, enter, enter. This is 16 out of 221 over 204 out of 2652 and then I would say 
I'm going to go the first fraction in brackets, 16 divided by 221 divided by the second fraction in brackets. I'm a little paranoid with multi-level fractions. I need to play around with my calculator to see whether I can lose the brackets or not. You get 16 out of 17? Uh, numbers, uh, question C, second card drawn is a face card, so we could redo this, except instead of a king, what would we have here? A face card. What's the probability of a face card? How many face cards are there in the deck? 12 and 40, 11. We, we could do this, and that would be face card, second card, and then first card was a face card. Given that second card was not a face card, you'd actually be doing second card not first card was you would be going this way up the branch i'm going to pass on that for a second instead i'd like you to scroll down here below to where you wrote your generic probability tree a couple of conditional probability questions that the math nerd within me just loves uh tests uh tests or diseases so write this one down, please. Okay. Suppose there is a terrible disease called vitalitis. Okay. Just making something up off the top of my head. The test for this disease is 98% accurate. And there have been numerous studies that have been done in the population, and you know that 2% of the population suffers from this horrible, insidious, uh, well, okay, we'll, we'll leave the adjectives off because I could fill a page from this disease, okay? So you know that 98% of the population is healthy. By the way, I'm doing this humorously on purpose, but replace the colitis with cancer, with HIV, with anything you want to, something more serious. Suppose you test positive. What is the probability that you actually have the disease? And the sad thing is, most people, if they know that the test is 98% accurate, and they know that 98% of the population doesn't have it, they assume if they test positive, there's a 98% chance that they have it. And sadly, some doctors think that too and give advice that way. Let's see what the real answer is. So there's two events here. First of all, you have the disease or you don't, and then you test positive or you don't. Let's define D. You have the disease. And how about P? You test positive. And remember what I said, Amrit, a lot of people will think 98% chance that they've got cancer. HIV, whatever. Oh, and by the way, the tests I've made up here, medical tests are normally nowhere near this accurate. So I'm going almost worst case scenario or best case scenario. Let's set up a tree. So the first issue is you can have the disease or not. What percent of the population has the disease? 0.1%. 
0.02. By the way, the most common dumb mistake I see is kids do this. That's not 2%. What percent is that? It happens every year to the point where I've made sure one of the probabilities that I give you is below 10 just to tempt you to write it wrong. I'm telling you that's on your test. Don't do that. What's going here then? Okay. And then you can test positive or not. Positive or not. Now, in medical language, if you have the disease and the test doesn't catch it, we call that a false negative. If you don't have the disease, but the test says you do, we call that a false positive. If you have the disease, should you test positive or not? If you have it, okay, 98% of the time you should test positive. 2% of the time you'll get a false negative reading. Down this branch, you don't have the disease. Should you test negative or positive then? 98% of the time you should test negative. 2% of the time you should test positive. You get a false positive. Because no lab tests are perfect ever. What's the given in this question? What's the suppose? Okay, we want to find, suppose you test positive. What do we want to put here? What's the probability that you? We want to find D given P. Can you see we're going backwards up the tree? And you know what it's going to be? It's going to be both over the given one. So you ready? This is going to be both over the given one. Both D and P at the... Uh, which branch is both D and P? Ah! Boom, boom. 0 0.02 times 0.98. That's both. Over. Dan, what's the given here? Letter P, which stands for? Okay, you know what? That's this branch or this branch. What does or mean? Add. So it's going to be 0 0.02 times 0 0.98 or 0 0.98 times 0 0.02. How many numbers do I have in the denominator? Put the bottom in brackets and get out your calculators. I guarantee the answer is surprisingly less than 98%. What do you get? What? What'd you get? I gotta try this myself. This is one of the most counterintuitive questions you'll ever come across. Point zero two times point nine eight plus 0 0.02 times 0 0.98. I put the bottom in brackets, check. I've typed it in right, check. I... You're telling me I only got a 50% chance of having the disease? That's not bad odds. And here is the horrible, horrible tragedy. And I apologize, I'm going to get a little serious here. Every year, people find out they've tested positive for something, and they kill themselves because they don't want to face it. When they don't realize the condition, the probability math doesn't mean what they think it means. So what do I say to all of you if you are ever going through a medical situation? Get a second test always. Oh, Jasmine, if you extend this tree one more level and then you work out the odds of if you've tested positive twice, uh, then it's much closer to 92 or 93. Okay. Oh, also, 
being a bit judgmental, if you ever hear of, let's say, an athlete or a celebrity testing positive for a drug, suspend your judgment until you hear the results of the second test. Because when so-and-so tests positive at the Olympics, it's actually... might mean there's a 50-50 chance that they didn't. Now, realistically, probably not. It's the Olympics after all. But suspend your judgment, and certainly in medical tests. Okay. See this question? We're going to just change it slightly. Suppose a lie detector is 98% accurate and 2% inaccurate. And you know that in the court of law, 98% of the time, people will tell the truth. Suppose the lie detector caused, calls David a liar in the court of law. What's the actual probability that he's lying? With a 98% accurate lie detector, it's only a 50-50 chance that he's lying. So polygraphs, I'm sorry. Nuh uh And the reason is because when it comes right down to it, most people are going to tell the truth. You're going to get a bunch of false positives, and that's what skews this result. Come on, this was some nerdly cool stuff, eh? Huh? I, I, I really, I really, pardon me? What was that? Oh, yeah, polygraphs. I mean, they're, they're sorry. Uh, by the way, the only way you could get these numbers accurate is to make the polygraph 100% accurate. Do you really think lie detector tests are 100% accurate? In fact, let's be clear. Do you really think they're 98% accurate? I doubt it. I doubt it. And medical tests as well are not 98% accurate. So the fact that you have lots of false positives in a conditional probability question can dramatically skew your results. Absolutely. I, I would hope so. Well, no, the reason they don't use them is constitutionally you're not allowed to incriminate yourself. I'm worried with the current climate, with 9-11 and all, that they might want to, and they don't realize mathematically they're garbage. Garbage. Why? Because most people will tell the truth. Almost everyone will tell the truth in the court of law with a lie detector test. And unless it's perfect, then that means you're going to have a bunch of false positives. People are going to be found guilty of lying when they're not. And that could really ruin someone's life, right? So what's your homework? Well, first of all, stay healthy and tell the truth. Okay? Questions to try. Now, I wrote page 461 to 8 and page 468. I see you guys tomorrow. Tomorrow with a short... Oh, I don't know. I don't see you guys tomorrow. Yeah, I do. It's a short Friday, and it's a Tuesday schedule. I may, for you guys, press pause... So I'm going to give you a bunch of homework, but I don't think I'm doing a lesson tomorrow. So page 460. Did you learn something new? Hey, huh? Hey. Page 460. Um... I'm going to assign number one. I hate the wording of number one, but it often shows up. It's weird English, so I'm going to assign it. Uh, I said to try number two. Blah, blah, blah. I'm actually going to give number three instead. Now, number three, instead of using a tree, you're going to fill in the chart, but from the chart, you can get all your probabilities by saying how many out of how many, how many out of how many, and visualize the tree. So that's good practice. Four is good. Five is the disease question. So five, yes. Six is okay. Seven is a bit overkill. It's a long question, although it's nerdly cool. Uh, eight is good. So that's on page 460. Then on page 468, so on page 460, on almost all of those, you're still going straight down the tree. Only a couple of times you're going backwards. 
The fancy term for conditional probability is Bayes' law. Oh, remind me tomorrow, I need to tell you why, had Marsha Clark had a mathematician on their staff, O.J. Simpson would have been found guilty because the defense used a bad conditional probability as one of their main arguments. That's tomorrow. See how I left you hooked dangling there? Yeah. Okay. Number one. Four. Five. Uh, no, I'm going to nuke five. Sorry. Why did I nuke five? Because I didn't assign it here. Why did I not assign five? Ah, uh, yeah. yeah blah, blah. Nah, skip five. I think the one I'm looking for. Oh. Yeah, that's nice, number seven, because it's university and passing exams, which some of you might be interested in, but it's a three-level tree. You know what I'm going to do instead? I'm not going to do the three-level tree. I am going to assign number eight. Now, number eight requires you to turn back to page 461. Okay? Last thing. So I'm done the lesson, and if you need to go to the washroom, now is the time. However, have you ever been standing in line, like at the supermarket, and you look at the line to your right, and you look at the line to your left, and you're convinced that the fates are conspiring against you, that no matter what happens, your line is traveling slower. Is that your imagination? As it turns out, there's a valid probability argument that suggests that it's not. See if you can, this, this math is at your level, see if you can follow it. I'm sure this week you've been trapped in a slow moving line. In this box, I have a gift that shows how to choose stores with the shortest waiting line. It's an old fashioned telephone. Now, of course, if you're kissing the phone, it's important. Okay, I have to pause for a second because apparently I can't have all this software open at the same time. So I'm going to go right click.